organizers of this conference. First of all, because it gives me a chance to thank him for bringing us all together here to work on this uh, week together, along with uh, Steve. But also gives me a chance to express my admiration for his uh, work. I've known him for a while. Um, he was, he's the student of my mathematical younger brother, Peter Jones. Started with uh, problems about harmonic measure, a topic near my heart, in particular harmonic measure on the relationship between harmonic measure on either side of the curve. Talking about characterizing when those measures were singular with respect to each other, uh, and constructing some surprising examples of sets with Hausdorff dimensions bigger than one, where these measures are boundedly mutually absolutely continuous. And also proving things like absolute continuity with respect to art. But it goes along in that vein. And anybody who wants to write a book or a survey of culture theory and planes will include a significant portion of this body of work. After that, he moved, he stepped up a dimension and started looking at playing in groups, the geometry, and house door dimension of the limit cell. And it's contributed just to many, many, many other areas, causing the formal mappings, questions about integrability related to the formal maps, and a bunch of other things that I don't know a lot about. Or you can talk with them. But basically, you know, when a field develops and progresses along, little nuggets or stumbling blocks come up that really slow things down. And Chris is famous for coming along with a very creative idea or typically a very complicated or difficult construction to clear this roadblock out of the way so that the rest of us can follow along and continue our work. So uh, now he has moved into numerical conformal mapping. All I can say to people Watch out. Well, I, I consider what I'm doing is theoretical for some of that and I can implement it when I talk to you about it. But um, it's true that in the paper, I have preprinted the same title as this, the Total Mapping in the New York Times. Unfortunately, it takes quite a lot of time to read the paper. Um, it's about 100 pages long or so. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, most of that is just messy details that are actually necessary for the statement of the theorem, which isn't the important thing. The important thing, I hope, is to leave the idea which is embedded in it. Something so easy, you can pick it up and turn it over and look at it and fiddle it to your own favorite domain or change it slightly and have fun, play with it. Um, that, that's really what I, I want to do today, is tell you what that simple idea is. So, uh, of so we start with the uh, Riemann mapping theorem, as I already mentioned before. Uh, formal mapping, you either think of it as a one-to-one holomorphic -one map or as a Holy Morton that deserves angles. And most of my pictures are from polygons only because we're talking computationally, and I want to think that you have a domain that's specified by some number of data points, I guess it has n, p, n parameters in it. And then how much work does it take to compute the conformal mapping on it? We'll have to talk about what do you mean compute it at all on how many points of this or some fun of them. Now for polygons, there's a court towards Christophel form, they think it's a solve a problem. Towards Christoffel form that tells you what the mapping is on any polygon. The problem is when you look at it a little more closely, it depends on some parameters. Um, these alphas are the angles of the polygon, so we know those. And the z's are the points on the unit circle <coughs> which map over to the vertices under the conformal map. So as soon as you know the conformal map, what it is, you can write down the formula for it. Uh, and something about that sounds circular. Really what that is, is it reduces an apparently two n-dimensional problems to n-dimensions. Because you can read off the n angles, but then the other n you have to solve for. And lots of people contributed to ways of computing this control map. And I just wrote down a list here to try to include as many other of the other speakers and attendees as I knew about. That they would mention in my talk. If any of left out somewhere in my talk, let me know and try to figure out a way to fit it in. A little bit simpler by Don Marshall, who just spoke, Circle Path, and we've heard about. There are people who attack directly solving this nonlinear equation for the Z's. 
So we'll hear a little bit about that maybe from uh, Vandrai and uh, Crystal. Uh, Professor Blue will tell us about uh, uh, Ricci Flow and Hillborn Forms of Rappermen. I haven't seen yet today. Uh, also has another method. Uh, there's a couple of surveys. Um, one written by someone in the audience. The other one just happened to land in my mailbox last week. But it was interesting because it divided up all the techniques into either some easy to describe method going from the domain back to the disk, or a fast method that goes from the disk to the domain. And the reason it's caught my eye is because what I want to tell you about today is an easy method going from the domain to the disk, which can be hooked up into a fast method from the disk to the domain. So this seemed, I thought I did something with it. Nothing was ever done. Now, I really got interested in this because I actually wanted to compute some conformal maps on the domains of tests and conjectures that come from hyperbolic geometry. Uh, Mark will be talking more about these on Sunday. Uh, it turned out I never actually did that because I got interested in other issues, which is mainly um, making, making some statement like on the bottom. If you give me the end gone, how long do I have to work to get within distance epsilon of the true map? I wanted some statement that says, well, you know, if you have an n long list of numbers, you can sort them in n log n time. Or if you have an n gone, you can triangulate it in n time. You know, you can predict ahead of time how long it's going to take, and that's the best you can do. So for control mapping, if I have n vertices, how long does it take to get close? And I don't want an estimate that says you can just run until it gets close or it's stabilized. So I want to know ahead of time how long I'm going to burn up, you know, processor time. Well, we have to decide what that means. Okay. It's a good time to push the arrow button. So, there are two things you might do here. One is, of course, I'm assuming we can't get exactly the analytic map exactly onto the domain, because it's not a, a formula for it. But what we might do is, we can either take a conformal map onto approximately the correct domain, but slightly off. Or we could require a map that's not quite conformal, but it's onto exactly the right target domain. And that's the point of view which I'm going to take. So I want to take maps which are on, they have the correct image exactly, but they're not quite conformal. They're what we call quasi-conformal. Conformal means that small disks map to small disks. Quasi-conformal means small ellipses map to small disks. But the eccentricity is bounded. And so it's very close to conformal if the eccentricity of that lip, which is the pre-image of the disk, is almost a circle. So K is what measures this, and if K is close to 1, you're close to conformal. Now, usually we take about a semester to cover all these things, but I imagine squeeze them into one transparency. <laughs> the main thing is, is that there's a thing called a dilatation. So, ignore all the words, but just look at all the pictures on the slide. If the words are important, I'm going to say them. So if you look at the pictures and listen to me, you can ignore most of the written. There's a bunch of equations here. The z derivative of a function to z bar. The ratio of those two things is something called the dilatation. And it basically measures the eccentricity. And the way it's normalized is that that is zero, you're conformal, and it's always less than one. The closer you get to one, the more and more eccentric these ellipses become. Okay? And the, 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 the most important theorem, I call it a fact because if I use the word theorem, this goes off to the next line, which didn't look pretty. So, uh, fact is the letters. If you're given a dilatation which is bounded by less than one, then there is a quasi-conformal map that has that dilatation. That's the measurable we want map. We're going to use that later. I wouldn't mention anything now if I didn't really need it in these slides later on. Uh, the other important things are this dilatation is zero if you're conformal. And the really neat thing is if two maps have the same dilatation and you compose them, well, one going backwards and one going forwards, it's conformal. Because the way this is set up, if you have a circle, you take its pre-image, its ellipse, then you map it forward by a different map. But since the dilatation is the same, that ellipse maps forward to a circle. So circles are mapping to circles under the composition. It's conformal. Okay. Um, and then another technicality we're going to need over here is if you have n tuples on the circle, are they the same? Well, in our point of view, if you take a Möbius transformation and lift one n tuple and put it on the other one, same entity. If you can't, but you can lift one up and put it down under a KQC map, then the size of that K is the distance. So if you do it with a conformal map, a Möbius transformation, this is zero apart, that's the log of one. And otherwise, how much you have to distort them is a measure of how far away these n tuples are from each other. 
Now we can, this is the metric that we use to, to measure how close we are to performing. So here's two statements in the theorem I'd like to prove. Well, I think I've proven it. I'd like to have it verified by someone else to prove it. The first is that given n gone, you can compute an epsilon approximation to it in time which is order of n, the number of vertices. There has to be some constant which depends on how accurate you want it to be. But you can ignore that if you want. You just want to think of this some constant depending on the accuracy times n. I think that's already pretty interesting. Okay. But if you want to know the accuracy, and over the last three years I've gotten this down to a power of epsilon, the log of epsilon squared, finally got rid of the square, replacing the log log term. This is uh, the best I can do. Now, later on at the end of the talk, I'll mention how we're storing the map, how it's going into memory. But basically the idea is that the disk is getting cut up into regions. There's at least one region per vertex. In each region, we have a power series expansion. See, you're going to have a power series of expansion in, in a, in, for the map, but the radius of convergence is limited by the distance to the next vertex. So you pretty much have to put a, a, a power series around all the different vertices. You need n of them. And if you want it to be accurate to epsilon, well, power series converge geometrically fast. So if I have n terms of it, I, I get accuracy like 2 to the minus n. It goes down geometrically. So if I want epsilon accuracy, I need log of epsilon terms of the power series. So I have n series, and they're each p long, p is log of epsilon. So the time here is the number of series, and this is the, the, the length of each series times the log of the length of each series. Well, that means I get to do one fast Fourier transform per vertex in the map. Order of one, one Fourier fast Fourier transform when I'm manipulating the series. That's how fast it now, to me, this isn't quite a mathematical theorem, because that guy, we can compute. What does that mean, actually? Does that mean for any of the uncountable number of points in the disk, I can hand in the images? Well, really what it means is I have this representation. Almost like it takes me that long to build it. And then once you hand me a point in the disk, I just have to see which region it lies in. I add up the power series, and I have the evaluation. So this is really the time to build the data which I can then evaluate later on. To try to make it look more like computational geometry, here's another version, where I have an end gone, and I'm just looking for the pre-vertices, the, the, the pre-images of the vertices, like in the schwartz christoff formula. And what I can do is, I can have constructed linear time approximations which are with an epsilon in this QC sense, that there's small distortions. And then it takes that amount of time. Um, so the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is basically try to convince you of this when epsilon is 1. So not tiny epsilon, but then I can get approximately the on that. And then at the end, I'll talk about how to get to 1 to a half, a half to a quarter, and a quarter to an eighth. So, a little talk about that. First, a little review. Um, hyperbolic geometry in the disk and the, uh, the plane. Uh, this will make your life simpler. If you don't like quasi-conformal mappings, we're going to sort of forget about them. We're going to talk about mappings, how they bend and stretch hyperbolic geometry. In the hyper in the disk, the metric is simply basically one over the distance to the boundary. So things get longer as you approach the boundary. In the hyperbolic disk, geodesics are circular arcs which are orthogonal to the boundary. So I've drawn some disks here. There's also hyperbolic uh, metric on the upper half plane again. Geodesics are arcs which are orthogonal to the boundary. So I've drawn the same picture twice here, except I applied a Möbius transformation that moves the disk to the half plane. We'll also very briefly mention the hyperbolic metric in the three dimensional upper half space, so living above a plane. Again, the metric blows up as you approach the boundary, like the reciprocal of the height, and the geodesics are either vertical lines or circular arcs. Everyone's sort of seen this picture before. The reason it's relevant to us is. Because quasi conformal mappings had those differential equations that looked a little complicated, I want to say something a little bit easier. We can talk about mappings of the disk to the disk, which are by Lipschitz. That's a top equation. It means that you're only stretching or contracting distances by a fixed factor. That's a little easier concept, I think, than QC. Even simpler is quasi isometry, where you put in an additive constant in those estimates. What that means is it's by Lipschitz, but you only care about scales, say, bigger than distance one apart. Because if the points are very small, your only requirement is that it be less than b apart. So it doesn't have to be continuous. You have points going to zero distance apart, but the images are b apart. On the other hand, at small distances, the left-hand side is negative, minus b. 
So there's no, a quasi-isometry has no conditions on it in small neighborhoods. And on big scales, the additive constant is swapped out by the multiplicative factor, and so just by Lipschitz. And a QC mapping of the distance, this is basically the same as one of these things. The classes are not quite the same. By Lipschitz implies QC implies quasi-isometry, but the boundary values are all the same. So if you have, if you have a, a mapping of the circle to the circle, and you ask, can you extend it to the inside of any one of these classes, it's yes for one class, and then only it's yes for the other classes. And so in particular, in our theorem, we're trying to get a QC estimate on something. We can actually deal with the quasi-isometry class, because it's bigger and easier to deal with, and there's no differential equation. It's simple. So I'm not going to show you, really, from this point on, things that are strictly quasi-conformal, but just satisfy. They're close to conformal. They satisfy this quasi-isometry of the hyperbolic metric with constant A, which is close to 1. So the expansion factor is close to 1. And the additive factor is close to 0. So when I talk about something being close to conformal, like epsilon close, what I really mean is going to be a quasi-isometry where the A is close to 1 and the B is close to 0 with an epsilon. So that short circuit is hard to find more many ways to describe what the power of the grid points Yeah. the value of it. Yes. Actually, we're going to find it. So here is the fast, almost, we got that one here. This is the theorem I said before about the epsilon set to 1, basically. It says you can construct a KQC map from an n-gon to the disk in linear time. So the constant is now just absorbed into the big O. And the QC constant is independent of the number of vertices or the shape of the momentum. Okay. So what I'm drawing here is not a proof, but I draw the construction. So the polygon is the outer thing here. And I put it into it a circle. Maybe I should have shaded it. So here's my polygon. It's actually a, not a simple polygon. It's a slid in the view Choose something called the root disk. It's just a disk that hits the boundary in at least two places. I'm actually hits the boundary in three places. Pack the rest of the polygon with more disks like that. You notice they sort of form a tree. Here's the root, here's something connected to it, there's a tree, there's some brick. circles connected to it, and down here. Because the circles overlap, it actually looks like a bunch of crescents, the way I've drawn it. Every crescent has an orthogonal foliation by circular arcs. If you're not sure about that, think of a wedge, a cone, and the circular arcs that are concentric with the vertex. Now, by Möbius transformation, that thing can be mapped to any crescent. Every crescent actually looks like that. And Möbius transformations map circles to circles and preserve angles. So every crescent has this orthogonal foliation. Now, all you have to do is choose a point on the boundary and follow this foliation until you come to the disk. That maps the boundary to the disk. That's the Riemann map up to a bounded distortion. Independent of the shape of the domain. That's true for every simple thing. That's the simple fact that everything else is. This is the theorem of Penasolic, interpreted by myself at the core. So it starts with something. I'll talk about it. Now the other page sort of shows whether this is a good approximation or not. Here's the polygon we're actually aiming at. You take schwartz christoffel and you have to guess what the pre-vertices are. Why don't we take what we took? You take the corners, you follow these arcs into the circle, take those image points on the circle to be the parameters of schwartz christoffel The middle thing is what you get. It's not quite correct, but it's not too bad. The right-hand thing is what you get if you just take n equally spaced starting points on the circle for schwartz christoffel That's a pretty typical default uh, thing. So at least it looks better than the default. Also, when you take these images, and use them in schwartz christoffel you get a real live conformal map, because schwartz christoffel will give you a conformal map. It's just not onto the correct domain. It's like the wrong one. But this domain is a QC deformation of that with small constant, with vertices going to vertices. So if you didn't like my almost conformal map onto the right target, you prefer really conformal onto the wrong target, you can go between them. Questions so far? It can. So you might get a map, if you have lots of fingers and you make a mistake, the fingers might start to overlap. So what you get is a locally one-to-one -one map that might not be locally. Nothing will happen. 
So here, left hand side is sort of like this little, taking a little break. I just drew a more complicated version. This looks a little, we get higher resolution. This is just a bomb top snowflake. And if, if you come up here, I'll show you a better picture, but I have to hard copy these lines. I didn't realize it wouldn't look quite so sharp on the uh, monitor. And then this one is a maze. Again, it looks a little better, but it's a square with lots of edges in it, and it's a little hard to see them, but I packed it in circles and then just done this thing. But in every case, you will get uh, parameters for the schwartz christoffel map, which are uniformly bounded distance from the correct point, the universal constant. Now the way that I pack, you notice all these disks are inside the domain, and I expand them until they hit the boundary of these two places. Now that has a name. If you take the set of disks which hit the boundary of two places, the centers of those are called a medial axis. In general, for a polygon, it's a tree. For example, you have a corner polygon, and uh, these edges inside indicate the centers of the disks which hit the two or more places. That's the medial axis. Uh, for a polygon, when that when that disk hits the boundary, you hit two edges, two vertices, or a disk and a vertex and an edge. And that breaks the, 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 the edges of the medial axis, the three types, two of which are straight lines, and then this one, the curve there, those are centers which hit that corner vertex, and the other edge is sliding up and down the top edge. That creates a parabolic arc. So in all these pictures, what I've done is I've taken the medial axis of the domain. And I just discretize it. I chose centers of circles that we dealt with in the hyperbolic metric down the medial axis. That writes the domain as a union of disks with a little bit of error if you discretize. But since we're making no quasi conformal error anyway, a little extra error in the sampling doesn't, doesn't do it. Uh, if you want to learn much more about this, the room is full of people who know more about this. Uh, ask Jack Soy, for example, how to compute it. He was one of the authors of the paper that showed, given an n gon you can compute the medial axis of linear time. It's not easy, I would say, but it's real. And then, if you want applications, I suggest you go to data science. Okay. Well, here's just another picture of the medial axis of a different domain. So here's the medial axis. Uh, here's the, I chose one of the medial axis disks for the center. Here are the edges of all the others. Sort of foliate the remainder of the domain. And then what I do is you take the flow, which is orthogonal to that. So for any simply connected domain, you can take a root disk, you can foliate the rest by circular arcs, then you take the orthogonal flow from the boundary to the disk, and that's the map we're talking about. Usually called the iota. But this makes sense for any simply connected domains, so although all my pictures are polygons. Are Now this, we'd like to say that this map has, well, it'd be great if this map had a conformal extension to the interior. That this map into the boundary of the domain to the boundary of the disk was the boundary boundaries of the Riemann mapping. But it's not, not quite. What we do have to say is how does it extend to the interior? I'm going to give you an explicit extension of it to the interior. There's one obvious one, which is given any point in the interior, like that one, you just follow the flow line until you hit this circle and then you stop. Well, that, that's, an, that's an extension to the interior, but it maps some interior points of the domain to the boundary of the circle. It doesn't even map the inside of the domain to the inside of the disk. That's a little awkward. So the first modification is at least going to give us boundary going to boundary, interior going to interior. That's based on this picture here. Here are two disks. In both cases, I've written the disk in pieces. In this case, I take the right-hand disk, and the left-hand disk I think of as a crescent added on. In this case, I think of the disk sort of equally, more symmetrically, and what I take out is a crescent in the middle. It has the same angle opening as these two crescents have the same endpoints at the top and the bottom. And the angle opening of the crescent is the same in both cases. But this is just a 90 degree rotation. I've taken that crescent and rotated it now so it points up and down instead of over to the left. Now I can think of collapsing this picture to the disk. I take points there, I foliate the crescent, and I move them in. So this part is fixed, and the shaded part is collapsed until it meets the edge of the disk. On this picture, think of the right-hand disk as fixed, then collapse the crescent down to a, a single line segment, and move the left-hand piece along with that. So as that crescent collapses, it pulls the left-hand circle with it. 
the two white portions come together to form one circle. Okay? In both these cases, the boundary values are identical, exactly the same boundary values. But just the way we extended it, in one case by collapsing an edge crescent, and the other case by collapsing an interior crescent. But the boundary values are exactly the same. The advantage on the right hand side is the interior goes to the interior, the boundary goes to the boundary, which is not true on the left. Now, instead of two disks, you can do this for any number. So if I have my polygon approximated by a finite unit of this, this is the picture I drew before, and the thing you do is you, you, you follow these foliation lines until you hit the circle. And that will collapse the whole domain onto the disk, but all the shaded portion is collapsed onto the boundary. For every crescent here, you replace it with the corresponding crescent. That vertex and that vertex go to those two vertices. The angle opening of that crescent is the same as that angle opening. It's just been rotated around in the picture. Now you take that angle, you take that crescent and you collapse it, holding the top fixed and moving the bottom edge upwards by a Möbius transformation. And when you move that bottom edge up, you pull everything below it with it as well. You can collapse that crescent down to nothing. When you do that, look what happens. I'll just show you a picture. If you have a complaint on the spot. Here's a continuous version of that picture. Full-size crescents, 80%, 60%, 40%, 20%, 0% angle. So I continuously close the crescents. And all those white pieces come together. Every white piece here is a Möbius image of a white piece up there. And the only Möbius transformations are the elliptic transformations I use to close the crescents. So that's a mapping of the domain to the disk. It maps interior here to interior here, boundary to boundary. It's not a homeomorphism, because several points in the, when you foliate those crescents, the whole foliation line collapses to a single point. But it's a, it's a, it's a quasi-isometry with uniform bounded constants. It doesn't depend on the geometry of the domain. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a quasi-isometric mapping of the hyperbolic metric there to the hyperbolic metric there. So by the theorem, there's a QC mapping with the same boundary value and uniformly bounded constant. I haven't proven that, I'm just stating that as a fact. Questions? Yeah, what did you mean? Can you explain again how the other points are pulled along as you Yeah. Um, let me go back. Just look at this. This picture. I think it points so outside. We're going to map that to an actual disk. The right-hand part of the map is the identity map. Okay? This crescent defines an elliptic. It's the elliptic operation which fixes the top point and the bottom point and rotates around those by the angle of the crescent. So the left angle, the left edge of the crescent is mapped to the right angle of the crescent by this Möbius transformation. Whatever that Möbius transformation is, you apply it to every point in the left-hand side. Okay? So the mapping of this region to a disk is identity on this and Möbius transformation on that crescent and the same Möbius transformation on the gap of the white region to the left of it. Now, if you're in a region like this, this portion here, I have a laser pointer, I don't have to get close, that's the whole point. Um, that's the identity there. You don't move that. That crescent defines an elliptic operation. You apply that elliptic to everything over here. Then that thing, this piece is now adjacent to that, because they've been brought together. You now close that crescent and apply that elliptic to everything down here, but not to that one, which is already adjacent. You leave it alone. These form a tree. You're working your way out in the tree. Each time you come to a, a crescent that's an edge of the tree, you take that corresponding elliptic and you apply it to everything further down the tree. And you compose those things. Okay. Now using cross ratios, you can do this computation more compactly, so it only takes you order than operations to do everything. The way I'm describing it, it might sound like it takes longer. You can do it. You can do it that way. Now, I didn't invent this picture either. In fact, there was nothing in the stuff that I This comes from uh, hyperbolic geometry. So this picture is really a picture of uh, three manifolds, hyperbolic three manifolds. And let me just spend, for the applications to numerical conformal mapping, you don't need to know this, but years of being an educator, I feel like I fill in some of the background. If you have a planar domain, there's something called a dome. We're going to hear more about this from Mark uh, later on. But basically, you take all the disks inside it and take the hemisphere of the upper half space. So when you do that, you get a blob which meets the plane on your, on your region. 
the surface, the top, the upper envelope of that is the dome. For example, here's a corner domain, and here's a, uh, a ray tracing picture of what the dome looks like. Hopefully, it, it looks good enough that it's in shape. Now, it turns out that in this dome, it's this upper envelope of spheres. If the sphere doesn't hit the boundary in two places, it's underneath the dome. You can't see it. So only, only disks that hit the boundary in at least two points contribute. That's the medial axis. So really, the dome is the upper envelope of the hemispheres corresponding to the medial axis. Here I've shaded this one. I told you that for a polygon, there are three kinds of medial axis edges. And I just shaded the dome corresponding to which kind contributed. So the medial axis and the hyperbolic convex hull basically say exact, they have the same information embedded in them. Now, when I Googled it, there were 26,000 references to medial axis and 71 to hyperbolic convex hull. So hyperbolic geometry's got to get busy. <laughs> Either publish more or get some websites up or something. Yeah. So if you have a finite unit of disks, the, the dome is just a finite unit of hemispheres. And in hyperbolic geometry, those hemispheres are flat, they're like planes of Euclidean geometry. So that's basically a, a polyhedron in hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Now, most of what I'm going to talk about is easier to say for finite means of disks than it is to say for polygons. So we'll do a, a replacement procedure, which is take a polygon, compute the medial axis, discretize it. And what you get is an approximation of the original domain by a finite union of disks. That means if you take the dome, here's the dome of the original polygon, and here it is shaded with the medial axis indicated. Here's the dome of the finite event approximation. Finite event is these flat things bent along finitely many axes. And these form a tree, and I just ultimately colored the tree thing so you can see the relationship. So most of the rest of the talk, we're going to be talking about this piece here. Now, if you want to prove any kind of theorem about estimates, what you do is you prove it for the final event case and pass to a limit for everything. Now, here's the, a cartoon. The line is the plane, the main. This thing is the dome living over it. It's a unit of hemispheres above it. There's an obvious mapping of the base up to the dome which is take a point, take a sphere tangent at point A, and expand it until you hit the dome. That maps a point in the base up to the dome. But two points in the base can map up and hit the same point in the dome, especially if we have a crease in the bend. This is what's called the nearest point retraction. In general, you have a convex body in Euclidean space, and a point down on the body, you map it to the point that's closest. You take a, a sphere around that point, expand it until it first makes contact with the body. This is the analogous map here. Okay. This is a quasi-isometry. So if you take any planar domain and you take this nearest point retraction to its dome, that's a quasi-isometry, not a homeomorphism because it can collapse. And that was basically proven by Dennis Sullivan. Okay. In this generality, which you really mentioned, it's due to Epstein and Mark. Okay. But I can understand their proof either, so I ended up proving myself for my own purposes. I published it. But um, this is, um, and the, the, the point is, is that the things that project up to the flat faces were the white crescents. And the things that, uh, that project up to these bends, several things can project up to a bend, those are the shaded crescents that got collapsed. So I just went back a picture or two. Um, in this, oh, you can't see that, I'm sorry. So if you take the dome of this region, which is on the next page, here it is. That's the dome of the domain we saw before. When you do this pro nearest projection upwards, the white things are mapping up to the faces of that dome, and the gray crescents are all collapsing onto these bending geodesics where the two faces meet. And that's how that picture came from the hyperbolic geometry of the dome. Now the final thing is an observation of Thurston that this dome the surface lives in hyperbolic space. You can take the hyperbolic path metric on it. Two points, what's the shortest curve in the surface that connects them to the hyperbolic metric? Thurston observed, well, that's isometric to the unit disk. It's really easy. Uh, here's a proof of Euclidean space. Here's the bent surface in Euclidean space. If you take the path metric on it, it's isometric to this. Now, you're in hyperbolic space, you have two hemispheres meeting. 
you take now not a Euclidean rotation, but a, 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 a Möbius transformation which fixes one hemisphere and bends the other one until it becomes flush. That's an isometry, because one side isn't being moved at all, and the other side is moving by an isometry, so lengths aren't changing. So two hemispheres is isometric to one hemisphere. And now a zillion hemispheres all put together is isometric to one hemisphere. Next up. Why don't we ask Vlad that? Um, so now we're already done, because we have this retraction map from the base to the dome, followed by isometry from the dome to the disk. Quasi-isometry followed by real isometry is quasi-isometry. So if you believed everything I've said, I've now proven that the mapping that I drew with the curves going into the circle gives you the correct conformal mapping up to a universally bounded <laughs> constant. Now, I haven't proven this theorem. There's a gap. I have some slides at the end. If anyone wants to ask, we can go through the paper. The proof fits on three, three slides. But I wasn't going to do that. Right. Well, remember that this is the dome. This is the, it's not just any union of hemispheres. It has to be the dome. And so wherever any two hemispheres meet, they meet along a geodesic, which goes, starts at the plane, goes up and comes back to the plane. You can build units of hemispheres where geodesics sort of come together and form triples, but then that's not the dome of any. Yeah, it doesn't work. Not yet. Some bright fellow that come along and introduce Steiner points into the thing. And they get it. Right. Lots and lots of flexibility. Okay, so that was the easy idea. That was um, sort of uh, the main thing I wanted to get about. Now I was going to come back and talk a little bit about how to improve an absolute universal bound to epsilon. How to get closer. And this has two steps to it, uh, which is basically Newton's method. Well, it's my basic point. Couldn't have gone far. So I just repeated the theorem earlier that we can compute an epsilon approximation in this time. And the first step is basically Newton's method. And if you give me an epsilon good math, I can convert it to an epsilon squared approximation in some amount of time. Now to make this work, I have to be within some radius epsilon not to begin with. So once I'm in the radius convergence for Newton's method, if I have an epsilon quasi conformal math, I can easily update it to an epsilon squared math. And then I just do it again to get epsilon to the 4th, epsilon to the 8th, epsilon to the 16th, for as much as I want. Trouble is how to get to within epsilon. I know I can get to within 10. Okay, so I got to bridge the gap. Well, what we're going to do is a continuous... Excuse me? This is a theoretical applied math. You know, actually estimate the constants. <laughs> I don't know. I could really use lots and lots and lots of help. Many, many PhDs these things. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make a family of domains. At one end of the family is the disk, where we know what the Riemann mapping is, namely, stand still. At the other end of the chain is the polygon we want. And in between are omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. And we have maps between them which are QC with constant very, very small. They're just big, almost conformal from one chain to the next. So basically what we do is we take the identity map onto the first disk, the first element of the chain. Well, if the size of these chains is less than the radius of convergence for Newton's method, the identity map is a good guess for the conformal map onto the next element of the chain. We iterate. Eventually we get a really good conformal map onto the second element of the chain. But since the, link, link, the quasi distance of that chain element to the next one is within the radius of Newton's method, it becomes a good candidate we're iterating to the next one, and so forth. And you can get across the chain uh, like that. And the, the thing that makes it all work is the size of epsilon no, doesn't depend on omega or n. The size of Newton's method doesn't depend. And the number of elements in this chain also doesn't depend on it. In fact, I already showed you the chain earlier. This one, where I, where I, I close the crescents, that's the chain from the disk to the domain. Each one of those maps is as small as I wish in the QC metric. 
there's, a, there's an explicit, I can write it down for you, map from one element to the next element, which takes one domain to the next, vertices go to vertices, and it's one plus delta QC, where delta, it's actually Lipschitz. So if you parameterize these by a parameter S, it's Lipschitz in that parameter. So you're closing every simultaneously. simultaneously. You don't get a planar domain in the middle necessarily, but that's not a problem. We'll just deal with analytic maps, not what you want to Here's the picture in the hyperbolic convex dome. There is the dome with the original thing, and then I've drawn the domes as I shrink the crescents. So every angle in the dome is becoming flatter and flatter. And eventually when you know this, the trouble is you may have forgotten it because you've done some more stuff in the meantime. Basically, you're good. Where were we? Okay. And so, um, well, I'm not going to explain this basic fact one. That just, when you go to solve this, this works out. The, the fact that you can take the number of steps independent is that angle scaling picture. Because there's a uniform distance between the beginning and the end. And so if you want epsilon links, you only need one over a universal constant divided by epsilon naught. Those are the number of steps you need. And you're done. So in order and time, with universal constant, n is the number of vertices we call it. What was that called? What's b? b was the set of vertices they call it on. All right. Well, here's a little idea on how to do Newton's method. Um, the basic thing is uh, f is our, I want to take the base domain to be the upper half plane now instead of the disk. I hope you don't mind the conversion. But I find it easier to draw rectangles in the upper half plane than the disk. So we have a map from the upper half plane to our polygon, which is quasi-conformal. So we have f, and we have this filetation mu sub f, which is not zero, we want to make it zero. And if we could find a mapping of g from the half plane to the half plane with exactly the same dilatation, and then we compose them, g inverse followed by f, that would be exactly a conformal map. That would solve the problem. Trouble is, in a finite amount of time, I don't know if I can solve that equation exactly. But what we can do is we can solve it with an error where the size of the error is the square of the size of the data. Basically, by power series, and manipulation is where we truncate off. So the actual solution is sort of an infinite power series. We truncate it off in the cubic term. We get the answer with only quadratic error. Now, basically, that is a fast multipole method. And I'm not going to say more than that. I'd be happy to talk more about it uh, if you like, but I'm trying to stick to the simple things. Now, I mentioned before, we're solving the Beltrami equation, which is Given a mu, find a g that has the same mu. Or another way of saying it is that the z bar derivative of g is mu times the z derivative of g. Now the way we actually I actually do this is by replacing this by a d bar equation, which is linear, but it has an explicit solution by integrating it against a Cauchy curl. And then you just take that and truncate the uh, calculation. What that basically is doing is taking a nonlinear equation and approximating it by a good linear fit, which is what Newton's method is. You, you, you fit the nonlinear thing by a linear thing, you solve that and it's quadratically close to what you want. Now the data, I mean, the way that F and G are being held is, the, the data structure is, we have points on the real line which are our current guesses for what the pre-images pre of the vertices are. In the upper half plane, you form the convex hull of those points. Basically, that's that shaded area. You take that and you cover it by squares. Roughly speaking, these are unit squares in the hyperbolic geometry, except for the boundary ones, which, which aren't what we call Carlos square. Inside each of those squares, we can find a nice power series expansion for the function. You see, if you're in one of these squares at the top, I think, which I really like to do that little pointer, you have one here. I probably laid it down somewhere. Right. <laughs> So one of these interior squares, remember they both conformal mapping has singularities at these pre-image points, because they map the corners. So no power series is going to converge at a singularity. 
But if you're up here, that square is, is bounded away from the boundary as lovely geometrically convergent series. A boundary square here that doesn't hit a vertex also breaks. Of course, boundary that square that hits a vertex is a problem. That maps to like a corner, like there. But in that case, what you can do is take that map and raise it, square it. If you square it, that corner becomes flat. Once it becomes flat, you have a Schwartz Christoffel, you have a Schwartz reflection that extends analytically. The square of that map has a power series. So the data in, 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 the, uh, so in, the, in the eventual program, what's being held in memory is not the power series of the formal map, but the power series of the conform map raised to a power so that that power is chosen, so it has an analytic, analytic extension across the boundary, so it does have a geometrically fast power series expansion. And then what you do is you just use a partition of unity to glue these things together. When you do that, you know the power series expansion in each piece, the partition of unity is explicitly given, you can compute the dilatation of this new map. It's not quite conformal because you're gluing things together, but you know what the dilatation is. Then you solve and correct, solve and correct, solve and correct, and the error goes squares every time. I'm doing infinite precision arithmetic, so I just think of them as real numbers. But if you're doing this in finite precision, you'd have to think of them as. Well, you could raise something to the pi power. I don't care about. I mean, we could raise it to an irrational power. I mean, the infinite precision arithmetic root two is not that different from two. But if we were to actually start thinking about bit complexity, then yeah, that would be definitely different. Um, now. How much time do we have? I'm already run over a little bit. May I have a few more minutes? Okay. A couple? All right. Take up, take five. Okay. There's this one thing here. It's not a square, it's an arch. Okay. In this, I have to throw in an arch because the convex hull here is being long and narrow and skinny. There are two vertex points down here. So that's not an isolated vertex, there's two of them. But if they're very close together, that arm of the convex hull looks just like a single arm going to a single vertex. You don't realize there's two of them until you get way down there. If I were to cover that whole arm by squares, I would need millions of them. I would lose the linearity. To keep linearity, I have to use an arch here. So one arch is a very a top, and then a bottom piece of the arm, maybe much, much smaller scale, like 10 to the 10 and smaller. But I only use one piece to cover. And in that piece, my map is represented by a Lorentz expansion, not by a power series. If I just want to stick the power series, I would just fill it up with squares, go have to give up the linearity, because I, now my number of squares depends on geometry. But it would be easier somehow. But if you're willing to live with a Lorentz expansion, one of them will be in that. The arches are needed for things like this. For example, that arch could map to a region like that. And that's pretty much all I was going to say about this. Um, I was going to add in a few extra points if you could indulge me. I'm still interested. So. Um, another thing that comes from, because I, I think this would be interesting for other applications, um, manifolds decompose in what's called the thin and the thick parts, depending on the injectivity radius, which is what's the biggest disk you can put before it starts bending in on itself or covering itself. On a surface, the shaded areas are thin. They have thin things that are cusps or you get a long narrow tube which is thin. Polygons have thick thin decompositions as well. Um, in the corners, basically, a thin part corresponds to two edges of a polygon whose distance apart is small compared to their diameters. And technically, we define this in terms of extremal length. But just if you want to think of Euclidean distance small compared to this part, every corner gives you a thin part. You always have two edges coming together. But there are non-adjacent things, like here, non-adjacent edges which are in some sense closer to each other than their diameters. Call this a hyperbolic thin parts. The arches in the previous picture correspond to these hyperbolic thin parts. They're long, narrow pieces of the polygon which cause crowding to form a map. But we should sort of group them together. The thing about these thin parts, they only come in two or three different shapes. And there are explicit formulas for the control map on each of those. And so in the thin parts, we just patch in a formula. And everything else, all the other techniques I talked about, just apply to the white regions, the thick parts that are left over. So thin parts are mapped with explicit formulas, depending on what kind of thin part it is. 
and everything else, that's where the angle scaling comes in, and the corrections, and the Newton's method, are only applied to the remaining things after you take out the thick, the thin parts. Now, I think there's some sort of version of function here, some pathness here, right? Yes. Yes. I think it's a good thing. Anyway, I think this is an interesting concept. I don't know if it's known by some other name or not. I haven't located it. Um, let me just mention that you can't compute it in linear time. If you have this picture, you might be worried that you have to consider every different pair of edges to be n squared. But when you map this back conformally to the disk, if here, here's, a case, here's a case with three vertices. You form a sawtooth region with those, with, with those vertices as the, the teeth of the saw. And then you compute the medial axis of what that region above it. That, if you compute that medial axis, these thin parts, you can read off of it by, you look for edges that have large hyperbolic length. So that can be done in linear time. So you can find these uh, thick and thin decompositions in linear time, not using anything fancy, just the crude iota map, the one that just gives you a universal bound, but not small, followed by a medial axis, medial axis computation. Both of those are linear time. The reason I want to mention this is because Marshall Byrne had mentioned a problem to me. He and David Epstein had shown that any polygon has a quadrilateral mesh where every angle is less than 120. And he asked if you could also get a lower bound. Does every polygon have a quadrilateral mesh with angles bounded below, away from zero? He said you can't do this for triangles. That was mentioned during his talk. But you can do it with quadrilateral, which I think is a new theorem. I hope, otherwise I'm going to show it to you. But Using this method, what you can prove is that every endon has a quadrilateral mesh of all angles between 60 degrees and 120. And you can find it in linear time if you believe the conformal map of linear time estimate. Okay. The basic idea is decompose the polygon into thick and thin parts. The thin parts just have a handful of shapes. They're meshed by hand. I just have a couple of pages where I show you how to mesh every possible thin part. The thick parts, well, what does the thick part look like? Let's go to the next page. Here's a polygon. There are no hyperbolic thin, part, thin parts, so the parabolic ones are just you take out a neighborhood of each vertex. You map that conformally to the disk, these corners sort of go to things like this. Take a hyperbolic tessellation of the disk. This is by pentagons. It would be great if those circular arcs actually matched those circular arcs, but they might not. But what you can do is for each of these, choose a tessellation arc which sort of matches it, and then in between, you can mesh. What's left over are pentagons, and then at the boundary there's some quadrilaterals and there's some triangles. That's how you mesh pentagons, that's how you mesh quadrilaterals, that's how you mesh triangles. You never use any angles except between 60 and 120. You then back forward back to the domain and you check that every mesh of the piece matches up with the neighbor and you're done. The conformal map can introduce an epsilon error of the angles, but there's a separate argument. You only use angles at 60 or 120, at one place. Right there, you can't see it. The center of that triangle is the only place that there's an angle of 120 in this picture. And in that place, you don't use the conformal map. You use a linear map, which preserves the angles, and then you glue it to the conformal map once you get away from the 120 angle. And then you can survive some distortion. And that's it, you're done. Um, now, everything else is a question. Maybe I think you should save some of these for the, the question session. But um, is this optimal? What does even optimal mean? When I start thinking about this, I get very confused. Because I have no idea what it would mean to find a proof that you can't go any faster. I'm not even sure I know how to formulate a mathematical statement that encompasses that English statement. So I would like that to be explained to me. Um, basically, we're trying to find quasi conformal mappings to the disk that have the best QC constant. And there's a theorem that says there's a conformal one. So you can push that QC constant down to nothing if you want. But suppose we added constraints, like you want the area of certain sets to have a certain property called the quasi conformal of Jacobi. Then how low can we push that quasi constant down? Not to zero anymore, but maybe a similar technique will work. I think uh, we'll have a talk about that later on as well. Um, higher dimensions. There are no conformal mappings in higher dimensions. There are only trivial ones. So if I have a ball, what's the best QC mapping to a ball? Or if I have a polyhedron, is there even an algorithm which will tell me if there's a QC map into a ball, or what approximate the best constant? David Hamilton's talk, if it doesn't solve this, I think is the first step on to solving this problem. He's going to talk about that tomorrow. 
I approximated the polygon by a union of internal disks. But before I ever thought of this, uh, Driscoll and Robesis did a similar thing. They took the polygon, they took a triangulation of it. Each triangle determines a disk by its three corners. You take those disks, you take the same crescent picture, foliate them, and follow the flow. They call this the CRBT algorithm. Cross ratios and, how do you say, Delaney? Delaney triangulation. So they invented this iota map all on their own, without ever having, as far as I know, known any hyperbolic free manifold theory. And what they're doing is approximating by a unit disk which is exterior. It contains the polygon. My union was inside the polygon. But their approximation still gives you a universal constant, universal bound. The initial step of their thing, I proved, gives a universally close approximation to the uh, thing. Now, which of ours is closer? They're both in a universal ball, but my estimates aren't enough. Now, the thesis problem. Well, what if you just add other rules of thumb? This map makes mistakes. And I can predict some of the mistakes it makes. Inward pointing cusps are underestimated. Outward pointing cusps are underestimated in a different way. Can we come up with five or six rules of thumb that based on local geometry would actually give you a much better approximation? It says, take, start with the medial axis disk approximation. We'll make these disks bigger, make those smaller, shift those over. And now we have the 1% accurate map without doing a lot of work. Again, it's experimental. You sit down, you play around with it, I bet you could do a lot better. And um, I think I'll end there. I'll just show you some pictures, some more angle skating families. I apologize for, for invoking the runover rule. Thank you for your attention. steps in the chain. Yeah, exactly, but I mean, suppose little end, suppose you have, well, I mean, the, the really nasty case is, oh, here we go. Uh, it's, it's Leonardo da Vinci. So take my silhouette, right? right. So I've got things, and i got things, and all sorts of stuff in my, you know, tree-like branching. Yes. And uh, I think we don't have to protect it. We're at the large tree. Yes. Uh, well, remember what we're talking about. The longer the tree is, don't you know? The total amount of time you're taking depends on the number of vertices that goes up. But the number of steps that you have to take in this chain is the same. Look at the picture on the bottom. The bottom six pictures are another angle scaling chain. From the disk, this is a square. It's a little hard to see this picture, but there's an arm here that the arm that comes around and wraps this way. This one, this comes down. Um, so this is something that's a little more complicated than what we had before. But, but what? Let me tell you another thing. This is angle, no contraction. This is 99% of the angle. This is like 95% of the angle. And this is 80%. So a small change in the QC image can have a drastic change in the shape. But the point is, this map from here to here is almost conformal and it has known boundary values. But it changes the shape quite a bit. But that's what a conformal map does. The map, conformal map changes the disk to a complicated polygon. But it would be a one-step operation in our sense because it's a no map and it's conformal. So it's not small in the sense of changing the Euclidean quantities. It's a small change in the internal conformal quantity. So it's a small QC map. So you're right, the, the, the Euclidean shape of it could be vastly different. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't explain that more clearly. Not as far as I know, but maybe we could do something like that. Well, for example, if by Beltrami you mean map back to the disk, solve it on the disk by the standard formula, and then map back to the domain you want, yeah. But I don't know if that's exactly what we mean. I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in this talk which is new. You can disagree, you know. <laughs> All right. Don't let me be too humble, please. <laughs> well, I, I have a preprint, and I've got more pictures that explain some of the guts of the detail, but I was really hoping you'd walk away thinking not how hard it is, but how simple it is. That's the reaction I'd rather you have after the talk. It's not, oh, this is too complicated. It might be true, but no one will ever verify or use it. I'd rather you walk away thinking, oh, there's some simple ideas here. This idea of thin decompositions, angle scaling families, 
there's this nice flow which almost gives you the Riemann map. I can go home and program that up and play with it and see what I can get out of it. I'd be much happier with that reaction than with, you know, thinking that there's lots of epsilons and deltas and hard things to estimate and stuff. That I, there is some of that, but I'm trying to hide that. There's a lot of crowding. Where, where does that you know, really show up? The crowding really shows up in these thin parts. Yeah. Because basically, suppose you have a long, narrow rectangle. What is the algorithm delta? It says the middle of the rectangle is the thin part and just uses the logarithm map to, to map the half plane to that. It takes the map of the half plane to an infinite strip, which is an explicit formula, and uses that approximation in the middle. The end, each end is the thick part. So it spends some time thinking about how to map the disk to the thick parts, and then it uses a partition of unity to go over those in a region where both the formula is valid and are. So if you have a, if you have a thin part and an adjacent thick part, there's an overlapping region. In that overlapping region, the explicit formula from the thin part is still valid in that region, and the thing you've computed by hard work for the thick part is also valid in that region, and then you glue them together by a partition of unity. So the thin parts account for all the vast changes of scale, they account for the crowding. Okay. What you should really think of this is you're taking a polygon, you're cutting it up into pieces. All the crowding is due to some long, narrow corridors where you just have a formula which says the scale at this end of the corridor is 10 to the minus 100 with the scale was at the other end of the corridor. But at the ends of the corridors, in the thick parts, you sort of have a scale invariant map, which is sort of everything is happening within one thick part. Everything is sort of at the same scale. Right. Well, the end here, remember, is the parameters in the domain. It's the number of corners. So, not you mean the best k in Sullivan's theorem? Yeah. Well, the, the better that k is, somehow the bigger the radius of the Newton's method will be, and so the fewer steps you'll have to make in practice. Uh, because if you have a smooth domain, then your k is very small, yes. you have the boundary to write it. Well, polygons are not really the natural Thing here. I phrase the importance of polygons so that the computation of geometers would think I was talking to them. <laughs> 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 you know, polygons are a lot. 